All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Celiac Disease Foundation Ask the Dietitian webinar for May. Uh, today, we're going to recap um, the panel of nutrition experts that presented at the most recent uh, annual conference for the Celiac Disease Foundation. So I am uh, very happy and pleased to present uh, the work from several of my mentors. And then in just a little bit later, we're gonna have a special presentation and walkthrough of our new uh, gluten-free and allergy-free marketplace that's available on celiac.org. Uh, so go ahead and type any questions that you have into the chat box, or if there's any problems with uh, being able to hear me, uh, please let us know as well. So let's get started. Uh, so the speakers at the nutrition panel at the most recent conference were Shelly Case, a registered dietitian who is a member, a longtime member of the CDF Medical Advisory Board. Uh, she's a dietitian in Canada that has been researching all things gluten-free for many, many years. Uh, we use as a great resource uh, for information. Also, Anne Roland Lee, who is the Director of Nutritional Services at SHAR USA, is also a registered dietitian. And then we have Dr. Yang Pan, who is the principal scientist of PepsiCo, uh, which includes Frito-Lay, who gave us some good insight about um, how manufacturers are handling the gluten-free trend. Uh, and then here's just a good uh, reminder. Here's our uh, fabulous marketplace that will make shopping incredibly easy for all of you who are looking for products that might have additional restrictions in addition to gluten. And I'm going to have uh, Matt at the national office help us with that in a little bit. So what the uh, nutrition experts covered was several key issues for uh, gluten-free foods. First, there was an the issue of safety and labeling, uh, which thankfully we now have a definition for the gluten-free label, uh, but they discussed uh, certain issues that still arise in labeling. Uh, they talked about the issue of nutritional value or lack thereof in many of the gluten-free products. And then they also talked about um, manufacturing products that are both safe and labeled and have uh, nutritional value. Uh, so Shelly Case kind of gave us an overview of when we started to look at the, the safety of gluten-free foods. And I would say in terms of grains, it really all started with oats back in uh, about a decade ago uh, when it was determined that the protein in oats don't actually trigger any villus atrophy in most people with celiac disease. Uh, what was found is that uh, oats are actually frequently contaminated with gluten. So uh, this one study, and I, I put all of the study references in case anyone's a, a nice nerdy scientist like I am and wants to uh, read the studies themselves. Um, so back in 2008, a study of oats throughout Canada, Europe, and the U.S. found that 80% of oats were contaminated with gluten. And the gluten came from a variety of sources, from wheat, barley, and rye. Uh, so that's a really high amount of oats that were contaminated with gluten. Uh, then another study from just oats in Canada found an even higher percentage, about 93% were contaminated with uh, greater than 20 parts per million, and actually up to 3,800 parts per million, which is incredibly not wheat-free, <laughs> incredibly not gluten-free. Um, so, so far, uh, these studies showed that whether oats were organic or conventional, um, Irish or rolled, whether they were from Europe or from here in the North America, the vast majority of oats were contaminated with gluten. So these are this is what really led to the need for um, specifically labeled gluten-free oats or oats that had a wheat-free and gluten-free claim on them, uh, which is currently what the recommendation is uh, for oats. But we also um, have learned more recently that there might be an issue with other naturally gluten-free grains, uh, which makes sense. Why would oats be the, the only special um, exception? So actually, uh, at Corner et al. in 2013 uh, researched uh, several hundred naturally gluten-free starches and flours that were sold in Canada. And um, almost 10% of them were contaminated with more than 20 parts per million gluten. And in fact, three products that were labeled gluten-free 
also contained uh, more gluten and were mislabeled. Um, so about 1% of products were mislabeled gluten-free, whereas products that weren't labeled gluten-free, uh, about 10% of them contained gluten. So naturally gluten-free starches and flours, this includes rice flour, uh, corn flour, soy flour, things like millet, buckwheat, amaranth, uh, these naturally gluten-free grains. Uh, then here in the U.S., uh, Trisha Thompson, Ann Lee, and uh, Grace in 2010 did a smaller sampling of about 22 grains and flowers and seeds um, that, again, were not labeled gluten-free but are naturally considered gluten-free. So uh, we find that the majority of people uh, are aware that a of which grains are naturally gluten-free and uh, eat them more freely. But unfortunately, about 32% of these products contained more than 20 parts per million gluten and actually wouldn't uh, meet the definition of the gluten-free label, which wasn't in effect back in 2010. Um, Thompson, Lee, and Grace also kind of determined from this study or advised that it didn't really matter whether a product had a voluntary advisory statement, which might include something like um, made in a facility that contains, that also processes gluten or uh, may contain wheat. So 57 of the products that were not gluten-free actually had no advisory statement. Uh, so the majority of products of naturally gluten-free grains um, may not be accurately uh, representing their risk of containing gluten. Um, so currently, uh, especially uh, Shelly Case and Ann Lee and Trisha Thompson are recommending that we consume naturally gluten-free grains and flours that are labeled gluten-free um, and not necessarily those that have an advisory statement or have no advisory statement. Um, so then our dietitians, our nutrition experts, looked at the safety of the gluten-free label so far. Basically, how are manufacturers doing with meeting the FDA's definition of gluten-free? So a very recent study uh, by scientists at the USDA, actually, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, did a sampling of uh, several uh, products in the U.S., both those that were labeled gluten-free and those that were naturally gluten-free and did not have a gluten-free label. Um, so they found that actually only about 1% of foods labeled gluten-free uh, did not meet the 20 part per million label or requirement, similar to what was found in a previous study on a previous slide. And about 3.6% of labeled foods contain more than five parts per million which five parts per million is not uh, the threshold established by the FDA, but for those uh, five parts per million is uh, the minimum uh, gluten content that can be detected by the current testing uh, methods available. Um, so still a very small amount of products are labeled gluten-free are containing gluten. So in general, um, you know, Shelly Case said that we're doing pretty well in the U.S. in terms of uh, gluten-free products being labeled correctly. Uh, but then from this study, we can also look at foods that are naturally gluten-free and do not have the label specifically gluten-free. And actually almost 20% of these uh, contain more than 20 parts per million of gluten. Um, so uh, what we're learning from this study, which is you know just a sampling of products, but if you draw a conclusion from this study, it suggests that naturally gluten-free foods are more likely to be actually contaminated with gluten, um, perhaps from, you know, manufacturing processes. Um, but actually those that were most likely to contain more than 20 parts per million did contain oats or had advisory statements, allergen advisory statements, which would include like made in a facility that also processes wheat. So the biggest red flag for products uh, to be contaminated with gluten is if they contain oats, which makes sense given that we saw a few slides ago that almost all oats in the U.S. are contaminated with gluten. So it's very, very important when reading labels to make sure that a product 
that contains oats is actually labeled gluten-free. Otherwise, it has a high likelihood of uh, containing gluten. Um, Anne Lee from Char uh, gave us um, some good advice about navigating the label. And she suggested that we always read the ingredients label and don't just assume that something is gluten-free based on uh, the claim that's on the front. And a lot of this is due to uh, the fact that some products still are mislabeled. Uh, she also just brought up the fact that manufacturers are still learning um, kind of what the definition of gluten is. For example, uh, you might find products um, with oats that manufacturers aren't aware that oats need to be uncontaminated pure oats uh, because oats are considered naturally gluten-free. Uh, she also you know, highly recommended calling companies if there's any doubt based on the ingredients. And rather than talking to a customer service representative, Dr. Lee actually highly advised, um, you know, making yourself into the head of your household and having a very official title and asking to speak with the quality assurance department to really get to the right person in the company who's aware of how they source the ingredients what tests they use, and if they, um, if you can trust that the product is gluten-free. Uh, then, the, so turning from the safety standpoint, we're then looking at the nutritional content of gluten-free foods and the gluten-free diet. So, um, a few studies from you know about a decade ago found that the gluten-free diet, when we substitute traditional grain foods like breads muffins, uh, cookies, crackers, when we substitute those with gluten-free foods, uh, we're much more likely to be lacking several nutrients in our diet. Um, the big ones are folate and iron and fiber. Uh, this is largely because gluten-free foods are not uh, enriched or fortified with any uh, vitamins or minerals that are usually required to be added back into traditional wheat flour. Uh, so it's very important to be aware that these nutrients might be lacking in your diet. Um, there are also some evidence that zinc and other B vitamins might be lacking in the diet. Um, but fiber across the board was very common to be lacking in people who started a gluten-free diet. Furthermore, um, several studies found that the average weight gain after starting a gluten-free diet is between 20 and 25 pounds, which is a very significant amount. So regardless of being underweight at the time of starting the gluten-free diet, um, so whether someone is you know, traditionally malnourished from celiac disease or if someone is a normal weight or overweight um, when they start the diet, uh, both parties uh, were found to gain um, about 20 pounds. Uh, and this weight gain is suspected to be due to the increase in starches that are in foods rather than whole grains and the increase in fat content that mimics the texture of gluten in many baked goods. So this is a really common problem uh, for those who are on a gluten-free diet, whether it's for celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, or any other reasons. Uh, so between a lack of nutritional value, um, mostly the micronutrients and the fiber and the potential weight gain, we need to be really conscious of the nutritional value of our diet. So here are a couple of options that our nutrition experts actually recommended for improving the nutritional value of a gluten-free diet. And I have a, a couple different recipes that incorporate these principles that I'll provide for you. So uh, using beans and legumes uh, for flour or starch in a baked product or a pizza crust or a bread is an excellent idea for adding back all the B vitamins, um, the minerals, protein and fiber into our, um, you know, the baked goods in our diet. And nut flours are also an excellent substitution um, or combination to be using in, in gluten-free baked goods. Then of course we have um, many naturally gluten-free grains that are high in fiber uh, and nutrients, micronutrients, including oats, quinoa, millet, amaranth, uh, teff, and mesquite. And those are just a few. And again, we just always recommend that those gluten-free grains are labeled gluten-free when you buy them. Um, so whenever possible, you wanna use whole grain foods instead of 
simple starches in order to increase the nutritional value of your diet. And I'd say that uh, gluten-free manufacturers are starting to incorporate these principles. You can find, um, you know, some baking mixes that have bean flours in them um, or oats or quinoa and more uh, cereals. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say it's, you know, a slow process and we still have to be really mindful of adding nutrients into our diet. Um, then Dr. Penn um, kind of updated us from Frito-Lay's perspective of what the challenges are to manufacturers in this day and age for producing gluten-free products that are primarily safe, but also uh, nutritious. Uh, so the challenges that she cited were one, the changing industry standards. For example, uh, the FDA and their definition didn't give any recommendation in terms of what testing has to be used to determine if a product is gluten-free. Uh, they actually don't mandate that testing even occur. And, you know, they didn't give much guidance on what are the cleaning and cross-contact procedures. So manufacturers and those in the industry are really the ones who are setting the standard. And for the most part, I would say that large companies are following um, and are setting these standards, just like Frito-Lay and Char, um, and that, you know, smaller companies might have more challenges to do this if they don't have access to the same resources. Uh, there's also changing definitions. So the FDA just recently in the last year established the definition for gluten-free, but manufacturers were producing gluten-free products for years before this. So um, staying up to date with the actual definition, and actually there's still clarification that's needed from the FDA. Uh, for example, uh, the current tests that are used are not very accurate for hydrolyzed products like malt or other fermented foods. Um, so we're still waiting on guidance from the FDA and from industry leaders in terms of what are the standards uh, and procedures that should be followed by manufacturers. Uh, this applies to alcohol. And then, of course, there's a lot of guidance that's needed uh, for restaurants to ensure that foods are safely gluten free. Um, then for large manufacturers, there's the challenge of ingredients and sourcing all of the supplies to use for gluten-free products to make sure that they are safely gluten-free. Uh, if you imagine, you know, how many pounds uh, or tons of corn flour that a company like Frito-Lay must use, they have to ensure that they're sourcing their ingredients from a supplier that can ensure that their product is gluten-free. Um, overall, all of the, all of the speakers really uh, agreed that the gluten-free products are here to stay, that however the sales of gluten-free products go, there's enough um, industrial leaders that have really committed to the gluten-free products industry, such as, you know, Frito-Lay, General Mills, Char, um, that are really ensuring that safe products for those with celiac disease will be here to stay. And I hope that we'll see uh, an increase in um, the nutritional value of gluten-free foods and that we can ensure that even more products are safe for those with celiac disease to consume. So here's a couple recipes that are available at celiac.org slash ask. Um, and so this recipe actually is from pulsecanada.com, which uh, was developed by Carol Fenster and Shelly Case. Um, and they have a great plethora of recipes that use uh, bean flours and uh, bean purees. So if you're looking to increase the nutritional value of your foods, I'd highly recommend uh, that website. And we'll make sure to have a good deal of them available at celiac.org. Um, so this one is just a delicious oatmeal berry bar uh, that uses white bean flour. And Bob's Red Mill actually has a white bean flour that you can purchase. Um, and you would also, also use rolled oats and make this delicious dessert that no one would know actually contains four grams of protein and three grams of fiber and a significant amount of folate and calcium, which is very rare to find in a delicious baked good. Uh, Char had this delicious uh, penne recipe up on their website. Uh, their multi-grain penne regate has um, two grams of fiber and uh, iron 
Uh, so it's more nutritious than many of the, you know, simple brown rice pastas that you'll find out there. Uh, if you mix it with a variety of vegetables and some shrimp, uh, you're going to have a good source of unsaturated fat and protein uh, for your dinner. Uh, then Frito-Lay provided us with this dill encrusted trout recipe that it would also be rich in unsaturated fatty acids and protein. Um, and then I thought it would be great to pair this. Um, the, the fish is actually crusted with uh, tortilla chips, which is a great substitute for breadcrumbs because I don't know about you, but I don't like spending a ton of money on specialty gluten-free breadcrumbs. I'd rather uh, just use something that's available in my household. And then you could easily pair this with just um, a couple different gluten-free grains uh, steamed or, or boiled in some chicken broth for flavor. Uh, so you could combine a cup of wild rice with millet and quinoa. This is a good way to incorporate new gluten-free grains into your diet if you're a little nervous about what their flavor is or how you'll like it or how to prepare it. You can actually mix a new one with an equal amount of rice. Uh, and it'll help you to, to grow your palate to enjoy the new gluten-free grain that's actually uh, even more nutritious than the typical grains that we use. Uh, so if you like, I will answer a few questions before we move on to the marketplace, but just a reminder that the recipes are available at celiac.org slash ask. Okay, so I have one, let's see, I've couple different questions to answer. Gluten-free watchdog maintains that 5% of certified gluten-free products have um, contain gluten over 20 parts per million. Uh, what's my take on this finding? Uh, so gluten-free watchdog uh, publishes, um, summarizes their results from the products that they sample, which is, you know, a, an interesting sample size. It's not comprehensive. And I don't think Trisha Thompson or Gluten-Free Watchdog claims for this to be comprehensive. It's just a good sampling of an idea um, that a small percentage of products even labeled gluten-free still do contain gluten. Um, and so this is why Anley actually recommends uh, researching products yourself. I'm just gonna go back to, if I can find Trisha Thompson's slide. No, I guess I didn't include it. Um, so basically a larger sampling um, done by the USDA uh, found that 1% of labeled foods contained more than 20 parts per million. And similarly, Corner in Canada found that about 1% of foods of starches and flours contained, um, still contained gluten. So I'd say that that amount is still up to debate and we'll probably need more research to show um, and hopefully that that the percentage of foods that continue to contain gluten um, will be decreasing and you know as time goes by as manufacturers learn about the standards. Um, how do you assess the risk posed by airborne flour in restaurants? This is a really good question for which there's not a lot of research on actually. Um, so we do know that uh, flour can stay airborne for up to 24 hours. Uh, so it is up to the consumer's risk in terms of if they want to dine in a shared facility. I'd say that the most risky um, food service establishments are those that do use loose flour, which is actually not as many as you might imagine. So I'd say bakeries and pizzerias are the most at risk and ones that if you're um, extremely concerned that you choose facilities that are dedicated gluten-free. Um, and then I also always recommend asking a manager or a kitchen manager or a chef what procedures they take to, um, or what precautions they take to minimize cross-contact. So uh, some bakeries will, you know, clean their facility at the end of the night and the first thing that they bake in the morning is the gluten-free products then they put them all away and cover them and then bring out before bringing out the wheat flour. Um, you know, I don't have enough research to say if 12 hours overnight is adequate time uh, to, to guarantee that there's not cross contact, but it definitely minimizes cross contact. Um, and then same with a pizzeria. Um, 
I prefer uh, pizzerias that actually do not make their gluten-free dough in-house because of the risk of contamination between the regular dough and the gluten-free dough. So it's best if the gluten-free products are always kept covered and isolated from, um, from any airborne flour. Um, and then let me ask, answer one other question. One moment. Let's see, I have a three-year-old who has CD or celiac disease and he bloats while drinking any juices or soda. Is that common and should I remove this from his diet? So that's actually a very, very common problem. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people uh, are afraid that if they have gas or bloating, that it means that they accidentally ate gluten. So to me, because especially you mentioned juice and soda, this sounds like perhaps a fructose intolerance. Uh, and Many people, not only those with celiac disease, but especially those with GI diseases are more sensitive to fructose and actually have a hard time absorbing and digesting it. So what happens when we don't absorb fructose fully is that uh, the bacteria in our gut get to feast on it and the byproduct of that is gas and bloating. Uh, so you can actually um, do a breath testing with your gastroenterologist to confirm if it is uh, fructose that your child is sensitive to. Um, some other common intolerances are lactose, which we've known for quite a while, but doesn't, I think it gets more attention than fructose, but fructose is a very common intolerance and it doesn't have to be eliminated entirely, but really simple, you know, simple juices and liquids that are high in fructose are the most likely to, to cause this problem. All right, um, for the other questions, I can answer those in about when we're done with the marketplace um, walkthrough. So here I'm gonna introduce Matt and we're going to switch over to a screen share. Here, Matt, why don't you come in? Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask the Dietitian webinar. Okay, so here we are. You should be all set to go. Okay. So thank you for joining us. I'm gonna give you a, a brief walkthrough on the gluten-free, allergy-free marketplace. If you're not familiar with the gluten-free, allergy-free marketplace, um, in a nutshell, uh, in a nut-free shell, I should say, it is a online gluten-free, allergy-free hub to list all kinds of gluten-free products, services, and companies. Um, and the purpose is to connect people um, to those product service and companies and to um, make it easier uh, on the individual. So this is the landing page. Um, to get here, you would just go to our website at celiac.org. And once you're on here, um, you can click on the marketplace up top here, which will bring you to the link of celiac.org forward slash marketplace. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the basics. Um, the first tab and uh, the one with the most um, well, the one of the products and one of the most comprehensive information is the products tab, tab which we'll click here. Now, when you are in the uh, products page, um, you're going to see just, you know, some products populate uh, immediately up here, and um, which is great, but we're going to search for things. Now, uh, I want to search for, there's certain allergies and preferences that I need to, to have um, out of my diet. So let's look Everything by default, by the way, naturally is gluten-free. Um, but let's say we're gonna do kosher. You need a kosher diet. And also, um, let's just do, you get the idea, but we'll do dairy-free, okay? So we have these two preferences checked off, these two allergens, I'm gonna search. And they give you um, what's populated here. Now, um, you look through the products, there's many products up here. Um, let's just click on one and see the information available. So when you're in the gluten-free allergy-free marketplace and you click on a product, you're going to see a simple description of the product, the category, meals and entrees, which I'm going to get to you in a second, um, allergens and preferences, as I just mentioned, the ingredients, you can double check the ingredients, find out what's going on, and also the nutri nutritional facts, um, which we click on here, it'll give you um, the detailed nutritional information. Okay, so these are for the, uh, the product information. Um, one more thing I just want to check off here 
is um, say we're not too concerned about allergies and preference right now and I need to go shopping and I have nothing in my fridge and I need to find some let's say meals and entrees quick dinners you can heat up very easily deliverable click on search what do we got here boom click on these guys okay um, I found the products I'm looking for you go on the website, you go in the marketplace, you find out what you want. How do I get it? What's next? I mean, I can look at it, but I, but I need these. Okay, notice here on many of the products, you'll see an Amazon logo. The reason for this is these are available on Amazon. Now, in the marketplace, um, we have a, a feature called the shopping list. My shopping list is right here. I want to add some of these to the shopping list, and I'm going to tell you why the Amazon is important. I want to get some organic light and sodium spicy chili, and dull garden soup is not an entree, so we're going to get rid of that later. But let's go for Amy's Thai Pad uh, uh, 9.5 ounce pack of 12. Um, I got these two. Okay, let's add a few more. It's going to be a long week. All right, I'm ready to go. Here's my shopping list. Okay, now what do I do with the shopping list? It's nice, but, but how does it work? Okay, there are a few things you can do. One is you could print the list. I could print this list, take it to your Ralph's, your Whole Foods, wherever you shop, and you have it there in your hand. You can check it off, makes it easy. You're not writing things out. You're not searching a million sites. Boom, it's done. Or I can email the list. I'm going to email this to my brother. I'm going to email this to myself. I'm going to email it so I can have it for later. Uh, if I want to keep this list constantly, I can just keep it saved. Here's the list. Now, when you check out products, most of the products on the marketplace are available on Amazon. A few aren't, and that's okay. The ones that are, you actually can send to Amazon to purchase. So we're going to do that. Now, here is the cool thing. When you send these products to Amazon and you purchase, purchase them on Amazon by clicking on the link through the marketplace, Celiac Disease Foundation actually receives a referral fee from Amazon. That means that each of the products, every purchase you make on Amazon through the marketplace, you're helping people through the referral fee. The Amazon um, donates a referral fee back to Celiac Disease Foundation. Okay, so, so I checked these out on Amazon. I'm going to go back one more time and reiterate this. Uh, you go back on Amazon. I send these here. Um, I don't want these anymore. I want, to, I want to go shopping and look for some other things. So just say I look for something completely unrelated to any gluten-free diet. I just want to buy a TV. Okay, I put this on there. Because you're still searching on Amazon through the link from the marketplace, any purchase you make on Amazon... CDF gets a referral fee. So you're helping people constantly with that. Okay, um, so I'll speed this up a little bit. Uh, the other feature on the marketplace, which is really cool, um, are the services. Okay, I need to find some services. What do I need to find? Well, as you can see by the comprehensive search tool engine here, you can search by companies, you can search by a category, and you can search within a mile radius. Um, what's important about the, the, uh, the distance radius is if you are traveling somewhere and you need to find a certain um, specific service, um, if somebody should get sick, you want to know where the nearest um, you know, clinic is, uh, whatever that may be, you can actually use this tool to search for it and um, plan accordingly that way. You can also search by, I'm going to give you a quick, well, these addiction recovery apps, bakeries, blogs. We're building this, so on and so forth. Really cool tool, comprehensive information. Okay, and the last tab here in the gluten-free allergy-free marketplace uh, is the companies tab. Here are the companies um, are listed. These are associated with the um, products on there. Obviously, you can search for the companies. And in the companies um, tab, you have uh, website information, um, some have contacts, emails, whatnot. Also, if you're on the products page and you're in a product listing, you can actually click uh, on the company from there and you can look through um, that way. Uh, one thing that we're doing in the marketplace, which is very exciting, is we're launching an app, uh, a mobile app available on smartphones through the um, Google Store and the app, uh, Apple, uh, the iTunes Store, um, which is currently in the beta testing phase. And I anticipate this app will be released at the end of June. So we're very excited for this app. Um, the app is the marketplace uh, 
the gluten-free allergy-free marketplace, the same functionality, but built for an app, um, very cool features. And um, I'm actually gonna be putting a video of this on the Celiac Disease Foundation YouTube channel by the end of the week, which is a sneak peek of it. It's about 33 seconds long and um, you'll see some features there. So please keep checking that uh, as well. Um, I believe this is everything on the marketplace. If you have any questions about this, you can always contact me. My information's on celiac.org. Um, and please, uh, if you have any questions or feedback, let us know. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for letting me be here. Thank you so much, Matt. So I'm gonna hang around and uh, I'm happy to answer some questions for you. And I'm going to switch back over to uh, the slideshow view. Um, so uh, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask. You can also email me at uh, celiac.org slash ask. Uh, so I did have a question about uh, probiotics for celiac patients. And there was actually a recent study published out of Columbia University that randomly tested a bunch of uh, probiotic supplements based on complaints that patients were actually having increased symptoms from taking probiotics, which um, sometimes seems, seems counterintuitive given that probiotics are meant to improve gut health. Um, so actually the, the researchers, including uh, Dr. Green and Dr. Lovewell at Columbia uh, found, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have this study in front of me, so I can't quote exactly, but they found maybe 20% of uh, probiotics actually contained uh, over 20 parts per million of gluten. And this was actually from um, either poor manufacturing processes or lack of disclosing the ingredient. So uh, technically supplements are required by law to disclose any allergens that are in their products, uh, but they're not as tightly regulated as medications or foods. Uh, so I do re recommend uh, Consumer Reports uh, and Consumer Watchdog for uh, determining if a supplement company is reputable. And I can't quite uh, give you any brand names on air, uh, but if you'd like to email me, I could help you uh, find some probiotics that are safer. Uh, really the best thing to do would be to um, contact the manufacturer and determine are they actually testing their product uh, to ensure that it's gluten-free. Um, here's another question. Uh, cheese, is that irritating to the stomach or the GI tract? Um, cheese can definitely be um, an irritant. Uh, usually it's low in lactose if it's a hard cheese, but soft cheeses are usually higher in lactose. Um, so some, some hard cheeses that are low in lactose and are maybe less irritating um, can be uh, cheddar cheese, mozzarella, Swiss, and... Um, there's another one I'm forgetting. I would look up lactose-free cheeses on Google, um, but those could definitely be irritating. And then some people actually have a difficult time absorbing fat, which might be in the cheese, um, or sometimes casein, which is one of the proteins that's in the cheese. Um, so I would, you know, definitely consult with your gastroenterologist to determine, you know, is there still a degree of villous atrophy or are we lacking enzymes in the villi that are causing continued symptoms? And sometimes an enzyme supplement can be really helpful in reducing the GI symptoms that someone has, especially if they're more newly diagnosed. Um, but a lot of people with celiac disease have co-occurring intolerances, just like lactose and fructose. So I would definitely uh, investigate that. Um, do we need to only purchase certified gluten-free nuts as well? That is a very good question. Um, I'd say that there's not adequate research uh, to say if with certainty that we should do that as much as we should with grains. I think it's never a bad idea. Um, me personally, I would look for if a nut product has an allergen advisory warning, I would be more wary of it. Um, but just because a product doesn't have an advisory warning doesn't mean that it's not processed in a facility that contains wheat. Um, so at this point, I can't really make a, a solid determination or recommendation based on nuts. 
Um, another question. Oh yes, Havarti cheese is a really good hard cheese that is lactose free. Thank you, Donatella. Um, so I've got an, a question about cross reactivity. Uh, we, if you've searched the internet for any gluten free uh, resources or sites, you hear a lot that many foods cross react with gluten. Um, a lot of times these are cited as uh, coffee cross reacts or dairy cross reacts. Um, and unfortunately, these claims are just not founded. Uh, these are more likely a paleo website, uh, if anyone's heard of the paleo diet. And in terms of celiac disease, there's no, absolutely no cross reactivity. So something like coffee, chocolate, or other gluten-free grains do not cause uh, the immune reaction that is that occurs in celiac disease. The proteins are genetically different. Their structure is different. It doesn't trigger the same response that wheat, barley, or rye does. Uh, it doesn't mean that you might not have some sort of intolerance to certain foods, or actually a lot of people with celiac disease just have difficulty digesting uh, fibers or may have bacterial overgrowth where uh, the bacteria are more likely to ferment uh, certain fibers in our diet. Um, so in general, I do not listen to any of the claims about cross reactivity between gluten and um, anything other than wheat, barley, or rye, uh, with the exception of oats, as some people with celiac disease do have a different uh, intolerance to oats in addition to celiac disease. Uh, let's see if I have any other questions that I haven't answered. Okay, here's one more question. To what do you attribute the low recovery rate among diagnosed celiacs? Great question. And I think that all of the pharmaceutical companies that are developing treatments are currently trying to answer that. So I don't know that I can say anything more uh, than they can say. Uh, but basically, you know, they're, we do know that it's impossible to live in a bubble as a person with celiac disease and that there is a degree of cross-contamination just from living our life, from eating at restaurants, uh, from eating grains that may be uh, cross-contaminated cross with gluten. Um, so it could be an issue of um, you know, not being able to eliminate gluten 100% from our diet. Um, you know, the level of, I guess, you know, there's different studies that anywhere from 30 to 50% of those with celiac disease continue to have symptoms or some degree of villous atrophy, uh, but the vast majority of them still have, you know, decreased risk for other autoimmune disorders and decreased risk for um, mortality uh, in cancers. So to some degree, the gluten-free diet is working for us, but to some other degree, it's, it's not adequate. And I'd say that that's why um, a lot of um, you know, hopefully more pharmaceutical companies are exploring other treatment options. Um, and we don't know, maybe there's a variation of genetics where some, you know, there might be some other, something else involved in the villous atrophy that we're seeing in patients, even on a strict gluten-free diet. Um, I got a question about taking psyllium powder or, or fiber supplements. Um, and it's definitely possible that a fiber supplement could be contaminated with gluten. Um, so I would definitely ask, um, you know, call the manufacturer if it has an advisory statement to determine, um, you know, to what degree is that a risk. Um, the best thing to do would actually be just to purchase psyllium um, you know, ground psyllium powder uh, in the raw that is labeled gluten-free. Um, you could also use uh, flax as a fiber supplement, um, and those would both, you know, be good for increasing fiber in the diet. Any other questions? Okay. If anyone has an additional question, they can email me. Um, there's a form there at celiac.org ask. 
Uh, one more question. Um, asking my advice about um, about uh, gluten uh, gluten enzymes or enzymes that claim to break down gluten. Um, definitely, there's no. Currently, all the gluten enzymes that are on the market do not protect us from villus atrophy. There's, um, you know, a good amount of research on these products that show that they do not um, have any effect on protecting those with celiac disease from having a reaction to gluten. Uh, it may be um, effective for those who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but if someone hasn't ever gone through the proper diagnostics of determining whether it's celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, I wouldn't recommend the product either. So, um, you know, the enzymes can help break down uh, the gluten protein into smaller pieces, which may, may make the, you know, the GI reaction of bloating um, lesser in those who might have um, some bacterial reason for um, having symptoms to, to something like gluten or wheat or some gluten containing grains. Uh, but I definitely, it's not recommended for those with celiac disease at all. And then I have another question about multivitamins and, um, you know, celiac.org actually has a study a summary up on our website about um, how there was incidental cross-contamination in many supplements. And again, this is an issue of the supplement industry not being regulated as well as uh, medications or even foods. So any supplement is required by law to, to declare any allergens. So if they, if they say it's gluten-free, technically it should be gluten-free. Um, but there's no harm in actually calling the manufacturer and finding out, do they actually test uh, to make sure that their product is gluten-free or are they put in the gluten-free claim on just based on the fact that it doesn't contain any gluten ingredients. Uh, so that would be um, my best recommendation. And they're actually, one of the CDF sponsors is Celevites. Um, I'll type it into the chat box. Uh, that produce a line of vitamins, you know, designed especially for those with celiac disease who may have specific nutrient deficiencies, and they uh, do test their product to ensure that it's gluten-free. It's not the only supplement that is uh, safely gluten-free, but again, I can't necessarily say them all uh, on the air. Uh, so I would just recommend contacting the manufacturer um, as usual. There's a lot of work to be done for us with celiac disease and us uh, in the celiac advocacy uh, industry. And, you know, thank, I'm grateful to be part of celiac.org, which, you know, is helping to bring this information to light. And I will be available by email if anyone has additional questions. Thank you so much.